All right, this morning we are undertaking the task of Revelation chapter 7. We are on a journey to the Father. We're calling it Route 66 because it is the 66th book in the Bible, the last book in the Bible, and we're on a journey to find the Father. Uh, at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, we are told that this journey is about the unveiling of Jesus Christ, that God the Father is unveiling His Son to His church. And through this book, we are endeavoring to understand Jesus more so we can understand the Father more. And so let's begin by reading chapter 7 of the book of Revelation. And by the way, like we talked about last week, this is an interlude between opening the sixth seal and opening the seventh seal. Chapter 7 becomes in between 6 and 8, and in chapter 8, we will open the seventh seal, which will unleash other things for us to look at next week. But today we're on an interlude. We think John needed a break. He had seen a lot of things with the opening of the six seals. And so today, chapter 7 gives us a break, but gives us a lot of images of what heaven is like and what God's plan for uh, the unfolding is going to be. So let's begin with verse 1 of chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth so that no wind should blow and on the earth or in the sea or even any tree. And then I saw, verse 2, another angel, another one of the same kind, ascending up from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God, God the Father. And he cried out with a loud voice to the other four angels to whom it was granted that they were able to harm the earth and the sea. Verse 3, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God with a mark on their foreheads. Verse 4, and I heard a number of those who were being sealed and I, uh, it was 144,000, and they were sealed from every, are you listening, every tribe, every son of the nation of Israel, from the tribes of Judah, from the tribes of all 12 tribes, there were 12,000 sealed according to each tribe. Reuben received 12,000 who were sealed. Gad also were 12,000 sealed. And from the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. And from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. And from the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. And from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. And from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. Verses 1 through 8 are about the sealing of these 12,000 Jews, the remnant that God has saved and preserved, and with the mark on the forehead, He is going to protect them through these seven years and through the three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. And then we get to verse 9. Verse 9 through the end of the chapter, verse 17, is about others who are being saved during the tribulation. So let's pick it up in verse 9. And after these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and tribe and people group and tongues, language groups, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, Verse 10, and they cry out with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all of the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell to their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. They were saying, amen, blessing and Glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever 
and ever. Amen. And we will come back to that verse. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, These are the ones clothed in the white robes. Who are they? And where have they come from? And I said to him, My Lord, you know. And then he answered, These are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And for this reason, they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night at the temple. And he who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them. Verse 16. And they shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more, neither shall they, the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb is in the center of the throne, and he will be their shepherd, and shall guide them to um, their springs of living water. And God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And may the Lord God add his blessing to the reading of the word today. Now remember, first of all, the interesting thing, we go to chapter 1, verse 3, we find out there is a promise given to anyone who studies and obeys the words of this book. It is the only book of the 66 contained in our Bible that has that promise. There are other promises, of course, to the student who digs and wants to know the Word of God, that God will bless that and give them uh, extra knowledge from the Holy Spirit. But this is the only book that says if you study this book, you will have understanding and you will be blessed for your endeavors. Now, chapter 7, remember I said it was an interval or an interlude or an intermission. It is something that's happening between chapter 6 and chapter 8. It is a pause or at least a moment to look into what God has planned for the rest of time, uh, at least time on earth, and then later we'll look into time eternal. And so chapter 7 is actually the answer to the very last question of chapter 6. Go to chapter 6 of Revelation and the very last verse, which is verse 17. And the question was, on that great day, the wrath has come, and these are the kings and wise men and others on the earth who are hiding in caves. And they ask this question, who is able to stand? The question is really, who is able to withstand the wrath of God and to go through this great time of testing and tribulation? So the question is asked at the end of chapter 6, and here is the answer. Number 1, verses 1 through 8 tell us that 144,000 12,000 from each tribe of Israel will be saved. And not just saved, persevered. They will be protected through the great tribulation. 144,000, 12,000 from every tribe. And yes, we must identify the tribes. It was Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. If you go into the Old Testament... And look at the children that Jacob had. He had 12 sons and one daughter. The 12 sons are listed here with a couple of exceptions. Number one, as they came out of Egypt, and we were given another, if you will, number of who they were in the book of Numbers, you'll find that there's a little bit different order. In Genesis 35, we have their birth order, and it started with Reuben, and then we go to Gad. And then we get down to number four, which was Judah. And they got replaced in uh, blessing order because Judah fell out of favor. And so, I mean, Reuben fell out of favor and Judah stepped into his place as the one who would receive the blessing of God. Benjamin is always counted as number 12, even though he really wasn't the 12th son. He was the second son of Rachel, Joseph and Rachel. And Rachel was the one that Jacob loved more than the other wife that he was given by his father-in-law, Leah. And so they started having uh, children, first Leah, and then Rachel's uh, handmaiden, then Leah's handmaiden, and then Leah again, then finally Rachel, and then a couple others at the end. Benjamin was the last or the youngest one of Rachel. 
Jacob's favorite wife. In 1 Chronicles 4 through 7, we see a different listing, and the genealogy is there, and so it's the genealogy and the, the blessings of, and remember, Chronicles is a retelling of the history of Israel, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, retold during the Babylonian exile. And so those four books from the Old Testament are now being retold and history is being preserved. And in that genealogy in 1 Chronicles, we have them talking about the birth order and the blessing order. Levi, remember, the tribe of Levi became the priestly tribe. Uh, Aaron was of the tribe of Levi, and so was his brother Moses, and so uh, Aaron became the first high priest, and Aaron's descendants and the tribe of Levi became the ones that would serve all of Israel. They didn't receive any land allocation when they came across into the promised land, but they were to serve all of Israel. There were 48 major cities in Israel from the top to the bottom in the first United Kingdom, and then there were six cities that were set aside as cities of refuge. And so if you had killed someone or done harm or broken the law, you could go to one of these cities of refuge and hide. And as long as you stayed inside the city gates and walls, you were protected and no one could come in and exact uh, righteous revenge on your person. Now in Ezekiel 48, we have a little different telling and the land allotment is listed there for after. Now this, remember, Ezekiel wrote during the Babylonian exile as well, and so he's talking about land allotment in the future. This is not going back and trying to rehash what has already happened in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's not that at all. It's a retelling. A Remember, Ezekiel is a prophet. He's telling about the land allotment that will happen one day in the future when God redeems his nation Israel. And so in that allotment, in Ezekiel 48, verse 2, you see the tribe of Dan is listed there. It's omitted here in Revelation chapter 7. Dan is not listed. We have to ask ourselves, why? Well, Dan, uh, during the time of the divided monarchy, after King Solomon, the, uh, two, the, the nation of Israel split in two, and Israel was in the north and Judah was in the south. And we have Rehoboam and Jeroboam who took two parts of the country and turned them into two different nations. And just a little bit later on, Bethel, which is the house of God, technically by its name, in Bethel in the northern kingdom became one of the first centers of idol worship. And they erected a golden calf there and also in Shechem north up past Samaria. And so this became one of the worship centers and the first in the tribe of Dan was the first to embrace idolatry. And so Dan is discounted in this sealing. Now, guess what? These are just the 12 tribes who were sealed for protection. There will be members of the tribe of Dan who will survive through the persecution and the tribulation. And they are counted, like I said in Ezekiel 48 verse 2, they will have allotment in the new Jerusalem, in the new kingdom that God will be providing. So two are missing, Dan and Ephraim. Now, the other thing that we have to note is Manasseh is there and Joseph is there. Ephraim and Manasseh are the two sons of Joseph. And so when they came in through the division of land, Manasseh got a big chunk of land on both sides of the Jordan River. And Ephraim was down below near the tribe of Judah, just north of it, near Benjamin. So Ephraim is not listed, but Joseph is listed. So if you have the name Joseph, it could well replace Ephraim or Manasseh. And if you added it back in, we'd have 13 tribes. And so that would mess everything up. So the tribe of Joseph is there. The tribe of Manasseh is there. And we understand that Ephraim is a part of Joseph. And so he will be added in the future. Now here's the thing with that mark that we were told that the, the angel had, he had when he came up between the rising of the sun, he had that, uh, if you will, the, the mark with him that belonged to the king of kings. It's God's father's 
It's his mark. And so as he came up, he held this in his hand. And he said, don't, he asked the four angels, don't do any harm to anything on the earth yet because we haven't marked or sealed these bond servants. So he's holding the signet ring of God, the mark of the Father. And they're going to take that and they're going to mark 12,000 Jews from each of the 12,000 tribes. And so as they do this, these people are not only sealed, they are going to be protected on earth throughout the whole seven years of the time between the rapture of the church and the second coming of the Lord. And those are two very distinct events. The rapture is God through Jesus Christ taking the church, his bride, back to heaven before any tribulation starts. As a matter of fact, beginning of chapter 4, we see that the church is present there because one of the elders speaks the things of heaven to John as he's trying to understand what's going on. And he says, hey, look, John, there's only one person who is worthy to open the seals on this scroll. And it is the one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It is the one who is the root of Jesse. In other words, the one that King David comes from. He's the root, not just the heir or descendant, which he will be in the future as well. And he is also the one who is the overcomer. And so that one is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he comes with that. So in uh, chapters 7, verses 1 through 8, we have the sealing of 144,000 Jews. From verses 9 through 17, we have a number that you cannot count. They're immeasurable. The 144,000 are from all of the 12 tribes, with the exception of Dan, but they still will have people and a remnant who will be counted later. The redeemed in the last half of the uh, chapter are from every tongue, right? Every tongue, language group, from every tribe, okay? How many tribes are there? The only tribes we're concerned with right now are the 12 tribes. But if you take the 12 sons of Jacob and add Joseph's two sons because Jacob blessed them and adopted them in chapter 48 of Genesis as his own sons, and that's why they got to be a part of the inheritance. So technically speaking, there are 14 tribes, the 12 tribes, Levi included, and Jacob adopted his grandsons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So all of the tribes are represented in these who are coming into the presence of God during the last half of chapter 7. So every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people and language group, they are all standing before the throne, dressed in white robes, holding palm branches, while the others who are sealed, they're standing on earth. Why? They are sealed. They are protected from death while they are on earth. That's seven years, and especially the last three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. They are sealed for protection. They cannot be killed during that time. So there will always be this 144,000 that are sealed and protected, and they will be on earth for the whole seven years. Not so with the redeemed. These are people who are becoming Christians during the time of tribulation, and they are coming to faith in Christ by the thousands and millions. There are more people standing in front of the throne now and added to it every day because they are being martyred because they are believers in Jesus Christ. After they are martyred or murdered, if you will, they ascend up to heaven. They get to dip their robes in the blood of Jesus Christ because they know him and belong to him. And when they dip it into his blood, it comes out sparkling white. Such a great oxymoron, but it is true. They don't have mentions of crown jet. They don't have mentions of holding weapons or scepters or bowls or anything. They are holding palm branches in their hands, just like the people who lined the city streets coming from uh, Bethany outside of Jerusalem into Jerusalem on the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry. He came into the town riding on the back of a donkey, 
and people were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when we get into chapter 8, we'll understand that they are doing the same thing. And actually in verse 12, they are saying, Amen, which means so be it, Lord. Make it so, Lord. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to our God forever and ever. Amen. They list seven different things to praise God about during this time as they enter the heavenly expanse and get to stand before the throne room. And there are millions and millions and millions of them. There have been a few people who have said and tried to calculate how many of these are, and they came up with a big question mark and said, nobody knows. But it sounds like that there are more people who are going to be saved in that last three and a half years than have ever been saved in total from time begin to the resurrection to the rapture Nothing that has happened in the church age will stand to compare to how many people are coming to faith in Christ. And guess what? They are being led to Christ by the Jews who are there. The 144,000 who are sealed know that they are in the presence of their Jehovah. Know that they have been sealed into the day. They are bold because they know they cannot be killed. They are bold because they know that now... Their name is not just counted in a tribal record of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life, and they are sealed unto the day of their return. They cannot be killed. They cannot be vanquished, and they become the boldest of the bold. A couple of chapters later, we're going to understand that there are two witnesses who come to downtown Jerusalem, and they start boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus as Messiah. These two witnesses are Jews. And guess what? These are not in the 144,000. These are two others that have been protected and will be brought back. Some think that it's Elijah and Moses. Others think that it's Elijah who never died. And there's one other person who never died. And we have a record of it in Genesis. His name was Enoch. These two have never died, and maybe it's those two. We don't know for sure. They're not named. However, we do know this. Scripture does tells us it is appointed once for man to die. How many times did Lazarus die? <laughs> Sorry, he died twice, but he died, resuscitated by Jesus, and then he died again to go into glory. So the only reason Lazarus died the first time is so that Jesus could show forth his glory to the Father, and show his mighty power over death and hell. But these two witnesses will be gunned down in the streets of Jerusalem, and there will be newscasts of it worldwide, and people will see the two martyrs laying in the streets of Jerusalem dead. And a few days later, they get up and back to life, and they start witnessing again, and millions and millions of people I can't wait till we get to that passage. Just wait a couple more chapters and we'll be there. But today we need to focus on these, these last ones, these uh, millions and millions of people. And John asked one of the elders, or actually the elder starts the conversation. John says, I don't know, but you do, my Lord. And oh, by the way, when he talks of the Lord here, this is not Adonai, this is not Jehovah. He is talking in reverence to somebody, a 20, one of the 24 elders who's wearing a crown holding a harp in one hand and a golden bowl in the other hand, and inside these golden bowls that all 24 elders have, and this comes into play next week in chapter 8, are the prayers of the saints, all believers of all time, as they have been praying, their prayers are going into these golden bowls, which represents incense and fragrance to God, because our prayers are a gift and a blessing to the Lord. And for these reasons, we understand that all of these things are happening to make sure that we understand that God is in control. He is on his throne, that he is doing everything. And the tribulation saints who are being martyred and come into heaven have washed their robes and they praise him and serve him day and night, according to verses 15 through 17. And they never stop praising him. And they don't get hungry anymore. They don't get thirsty anymore. They don't even get hot. 
So heaven's a cool place. Yeah, I like that. Anyway, and so in Genesis 13, 15, we're talking about the ethnic version of Israel, that they will be restored by the Lord. Guess what? They're going to be restored by the Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, the 12 apostles are told by Jesus that they will sit on 12 thrones. That's why some people believe that the, out of the 24, there are 12 of them who are the apostles who will be sitting because Jesus said in uh, Matthew 19, 28, that you will sit on thrones to judge the 12 tribes. Number one, that means that the 12 tribes will be there, or some of them anyway. And so now we know that we have some sealed, and we have others who are coming to faith in Christ during the tribulation and are being murdered for their faith and coming to heaven to be with Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, verse 6, and then 7 and 8, uh, the disciples asked Jesus about what the end time will look like. In chapter uh, 1, verse 7, he says, It's not for any of you to know. Only my Father knows. Jesus didn't even know at that time because he was still on earth. And then in verse 8, the famous verse that most of us know, Therefore, I'm telling you, go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the hated place, and all of the rest of the world. Go and be my witnesses. He'd already given them the great commission in Matthew 28. And now he's telling them, reminding them that all of these things are happening so that men and women and boys and girls will come to faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Israel will be saved. It, uh, Paul tells us very clearly in Romans 11, verses 25 and 26, that God doesn't give up on Israel, that he holds them secure, and he has a special plan for them. He's sealing them unto the day so that in the great tribulation, these 144,000 will become bold witnesses for the Messiah. And in Jeremiah 31, not only do we have uh, the blessing of the new covenant in verses 31 through 34, but in verses 35 and 36, we have a promise of God who is the great promise keeper. And he says to all of us and to the nation of Israel that he will restore Israel to the rightful place, the place that God has protected and kept for them. And then, oh, by the way, in Romans 8, verses 35 through 39, the summary of that is that God will do whatever God says he will do. And so in the midst of the wrath that is to come, in the midst of everything that's going on, God does not forget his mercy. Wow, I know that's a lot for today. But guess what? The interlude at least gives us three different things to point to. To say, oh, God, thank you that you have taken all of this into account. So the first thing in the interlude, it reminds us who is first. And by the way, it is Jesus. Jesus is first. And we are restored with him so that the bond will not be broken. Scripture tells us that no one can take us out of the hand of God. Secondly, the, this interlude of chapter 7 reminds us what's important. It reminds us of what's important, and that is our priority. Number one, it reminds us of who's first place, and number two, it reminds us of our priorities, which are his priorities. Uh, Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, why is that? Well, if we delight in him, we know him, we learn of him, and he will give us the desires of our hearts because our desires are changing and lining up to who he is and what he has in store for us. Number three, the interlude reminds us that we need to refresh ourselves. Because it's all worth it. We need to refresh ourselves because it's all worth it. Guess what? That gives us a new perspective. 
not our perspective, not a worldly perspective. If you listen to the world out there, guess what? They are going to tell you it's all about you. It's called humanism. It's all about you. You are the center of the universe, not just your own universe. You are the center of the universe. I've got bad news for you and anyone who else who says that. God is not even the center of the universe. God created the universe. God looks at the universe. He controls the universe. So God is the universe and not in some metaphysical kind of way that you can attain or aspire to find God out there in the universe somehow. The only way to know God is through his son, Jesus Christ, because Jesus himself said a couple of things that are really important today. Number one, he said, if you know me, you know the Father. Jesus, according to the book of Hebrews, is the exact representation of his Father in heaven, the majesty who sits on the throne. You know what the second most important thing Jesus said is? I, this is Jesus talking, I am the truth, I am the way, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So we have three good things coming out of this interlude, reminding us who's in first place, and his name is Jesus, and he will restore us. Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm, verse 3, one of my favorite verses in scripture, he restores my soul. The second thing we're reminded of is that it's important that we align our priorities with who God is and what he has in store for us. And then the third thing that we are reminded of is that we need to refresh ourselves into the word of Christ and to his blessing because it's all worth it and he will give us a new perspective. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says that we need to guard our hearts, protect our ways, and turn from the ways of the world and seek him with everything that we are so that we understand who Jesus is and we learn to live for him and for his kingdom. So yes, chapter 7 may be an interval, but chapter 7 is a powerful interval. It shows us part of the plan of God that he is protecting and saving the nation of Israel. He's preserving them by sealing 144,000 of them. They become witnesses and they are leading Gentiles and Jews alike to the Lord as their Savior. And they are a formidable force during the tribulation because God has sealed them and protected them. And they are worshiping God by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who need to hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for the hearing of your word. I thank you for the reading and listening of your word. I thank you for the promises in your word because they are all true because you are truth and we know that. And so, Father, we thank you for that. Father, help us to take chapter 7 of the book of Revelation to heart and know that there are things that we need to understand about how you are doing your business. You are protecting and preserving Israel. You are winning men and women and boys and girls to faith in Jesus Christ. And millions and millions and billions of people during the Great Tribulation are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And oh, hallelujah. That what they don't hear now and before the rapture of the church, they will hear later and it will finally start to sink in that you desire a relationship with them and that you have done everything to help them come into favor with you. And so, Father, we pray that billions on that day will be counted as yours. And so, Father, we thank you for your plan. We thank you for your son because he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He is everything and he is all to us, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, our friend. And he leads us into your presence because to know Jesus Christ is to know the Father. And so we ask in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, we thank you and bless you, God. Amen and amen.